thanks everybody for, for coming out today. Um, this is our sort of second part of a two-part webinar that we're putting together. Uh, last one was uh, just before Christmas time. So um, if you haven't seen the first part of the webinar, don't worry, we'll do a, a bit of a recap today on some of the sort of key takeaways from that webinar. Um, and then we'll get into sort of the next part. Uh, and really the, the focus for today is on sort of the methodology or at least one methodology of identifying and quantifying sanitary maintenance hole inflow and infiltration. Um, and so, you know, we have a lot of different methods and a lot of different activities that we do at Civica. Um, so this is one aspect of our INI overall INI program and INI strategy here. Um, so I encourage you to reach out if there's anything else you're interested in. Um, and this is a, you know, a series of webinars that we're doing over the course of, um, of this year. We're, we're probably going to do at least one per quarter, if not more. So uh, yeah, look out for, for more activity and more sort of ideas and, and thoughts that are going to come out of us uh, as we move through the year. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll get started. Uh, second. So just a little bit um, before we start. So uh, basically, there's a this is a two part webinar. So the presentation, and then a, a sort of Q&A discussion session at the end. So you should have the option at the bottom to type uh, questions, you should, you should have a Q&A box, um, but there's also a chat box. So as we go through um, the presentation, if you have any questions during the presentations, feel free to write them into the Q&A and we can address those at the end. Um, just so, you know, top of mind, you can you can just write them in as we go. Um, and just to let you know, we do uh, traditionally have some polls throughout the webinar. So as we go through, you'll see some polls pop up. So um, hopefully that will work and, and you can interact with the polls and we can learn a bit more about you and, and uh, and sort of kind of see what what uh, what your priorities are and and, um, and and yeah learn a little bit more about the audience. So we're up over eighty, which is great. Um, so the presentation. So we'll do a little bit of an intro and background about us and sort of uh, I and I. We'll, we'll keep that fairly brief. Um, we'll do a quick recap of our last webinar, which ties kind of right into this, uh, talking about some of the municipal drainage standards, um, the, what the impacts to sanitary systems are. Um, we'll get it into an intro of dual drainage modeling, um, what it is and why I do it. Uh, and then we'll get into case studies. And so we have a few different studies that we've been able to perform and talk a little bit about uh, maintenance hole flood testing. Um, and then finally, we'll talk uh, just briefly, you know, most of the focus is on sort of ID and quantification as per the title, but we'll talk a little bit about remediation, how we can, you know, potentially fix some of these issues and, and talk about INI reduction, well, ultimately, which a lot of, uh, a lot of municipalities are very interested in, and then a bit of a conclusion and what's next um, for us and for, for the series and, and for this topic, really. Um, so a little bit about us, uh, so Civica, um, we're basically, you know, in a nutshell, we're collection systems and INI specialists. Um, so we do a lot of work with municipalities, um, the land development community, um, and really just really focused on uh, capacity and, and how to manage capacity in, in collection systems. Um, so really our, our sort of mission here is to help sort of build, build resilient communities at a period of you know rapid development, rapid growth, as well as a change in climate. So getting the most out of existing infrastructure, assessing capacities, coming up with sort of unique solutions to capacity constraints has really been a sort of key emphasis for us in the last uh, 10 years or so that Civic has been around. And there's just a sort of list of services that you can see on the, the right hand side that, uh, that we are involved with. Um, so I'll talk, uh, I guess I'll do a brief introduction of, introduction of myself. So I'm Matt Malone, I'm, I'm a project manager and the VP of business development at Civica. Uh, I've been working on all things water related for the last you know, 10 years or so. Um, and you know, I started with Civica back in 2015, um, mostly working on INI flow monitoring and collection systems projects. Um, I did a brief sort of stint at the region of Peel. So I worked there for a year in their asset management uh, and state of good repair group, and then came back to Civica in 2020. And, and so I've been here ever since. 
Uh, and yeah, I'll pass it over to Ed to do a bit of an intro for himself. Hello, everybody. Um, good to be here. Yes, as Matt said, my name is Edward Graham. I know a few of you. I don't know most of you, in fact. Um, I am a water resources engineer. I, am, I got a, about 32 years experience. Uh, I started off doing mostly modeling of stormwater drainage systems um, and uh, specifically dual drainage systems back in the late 80s and 90s. That seems to have dropped off uh, the modeling requirements. Uh, if you were at the Ministry of the Environment's um, uh, CLI ECA meetings yesterday and today, yesterday was about sanitary, today was about storm, you will know that, that there's, there are new uh, guidelines and requirements that are being introduced by the Ministry of the Environment to um, uh, analyze um, both storm and drainage systems and their interactions. This is the key aspect of uh, this presentation is it's why these systems interact. And this is what I've been doing um, pretty much my entire career. Um, so um, you, I, I don't know, Matt, are we going to have a Q&A at the end or not? Uh, uh, yep. If you want to find out more about what we do and how we do it and so on, we'll be glad to discuss it further, further on. Awesome. Thanks, Ed. Um, so you know, a little bit about us, which is great. So we'd love to know a little more about you. So I'll just launch the first poll. Um, very simple question as to uh, what type of organization you work for. So you should see a poll um, pop up uh, in front of you. So please answer and we'll just give a, a few seconds for, for the answers to come in. Okay, so that's probably pretty good. So it looks like about, uh, I'd say about a 70% 70, 70 municipalities, 25 engineering, consulting and contracting, um, you know, a couple people from provincial governments and agencies. So a pretty good mix, but quite a few municipal folks on the line today, which is great. Um, so again, just the sort of the objective for today, uh, just going to recap um, our previous webinar. Um, everything we do, we have been posting on our website and on YouTube. So if, if you do want to go back and check out um, the previous webinar, please feel free to do so. Um, so we'll do a quick you know, recap of, of the last one and just talk about sort of setting up the second half of the presentation today. And then ultimately, that's really what, what the focus is, is you know, identifying, quantifying, and, and remediating sanitary system capacity. And that's a lot of you know, the objective for, for most of the um, webinars and presentations that we do is really looking at solutions and, and how we can um, you know, frame a problem, but also come up with solutions for, for some of the problems that I know a lot of municipalities are facing across Ontario, across Canada, really, and, and North America wide. Um, so, you know, when we talk about I&I, &I, I'll just do a, a quick background on, on inflow and infiltration. So, um, you know, when we talk about sanitary or wastewater sewers, um, they're typically designed to, to collect wastewater. Um, so the, that which originates from, from houses and, and in industry and commercial activities. Um, and typically there is an allowance for I&I. &I, so it's, it's usually some small portion of, of that capacity is sort of reserved for I&I. &I. Um, so in your ideal situation, which I have on, on the top here, this is typically what you would kind of hope to happen in, in your sewer system. Um, however, in, in a lot of cases, there's uh, excess INI, so there's more INI in the system than, than that allowance, um, which, you know, in this particular case, in, in the illustration on the top right, it's not necessarily a, a problem or an issue, but when we do run into issues, when we have these systems that get over capacity, you may have something like, you know, backups and, and sewage going into people's basements or overflows to the environment. So this is the reason why we talk about INI, and this is why, um, you know, we, we want to come up with, with potential solutions to this, this problem. Um, so there's a number of different drivers for reduction, as I've already mentioned. Um, basement flooding and sewer backs up, backups are a key part of that, as well as environmental protection. So trying to reduce things like combined sewer overflows, sanitary sewer overflows, and bypassing the treatment plant. Um, 
you know, a lot of the time, if we're trying to accommodate these flows, we need to build bigger pipes, bigger pumping stations, building builder, uh, bigger treatment plants. And so these are, you know, fairly costly infrastructure upgrades that need to be accounted for and planned for and ultimately the capital set aside to do these upgrades. So um, th there's certainly a, a case to try and reduce as much I and I before doing some of those uh, upgrades. Um, growth needs, so trying to accommodate new development um, in, into existing infrastructure. So whether that's through new greenfield that's tapping into existing infrastructure or as a lot of municipalities are going through right now in terms of intensification and uh, sort of building up, not out. And this is a, a big sort of driver for, for reducing wet weather flow in a lot of, uh, in a lot of uh, jurisdictions. And then regulatory compliance. So as Ed mentioned before, in, in Ontario, we have the MECP uh, CLI ECA regulations, a lot of acronyms, but uh, certainly some regulatory compliance and and, um, and and trying to stay within those design criteria or overall sort of uh, goal of, of these collection systems. So we'll talk a little bit, you know, and, and this is just sort of a carryover from the last uh, slide. So um, I'm just going to launch another poll and, and you know, I, these are all you know, drivers and reasons why we should uh, reduce I and I, but uh, just curious from a sort of, uh, um, you know, sc scanning the audience and pulling the audience as to what your type top priority is right now, um, which one of these is sort of driving um, uh, your need maybe to reduce I and I at, at this point in time. So you should see another poll question pop up. We're getting quite a few answers now. It's quite a quite a mix, I would say, at this point. Um, wow. So it looks like uh, we've got about seventy answers in so far. So about twenty percent regulatory compliance, twenty percent uh, to eliminate basement flooding, uh, reduce bypass and overflows with twenty percent, ten percent for avoiding pumping station and treatment plant upgrades, and and uh, about thirty percent to support new growth. So a little bit higher on the support new growth side. So uh, we we did another, you know, this is sort of your top priority. So curious as to you know what's your next highest priority. Um, based on <laughs> based on the answers to the last question, I feel like we're going to get a, another good sort of mix here. <laughs> but uh, curious, you know, just to get your sort of two top priorities when we talk about reducing I and I, what what are the sort of drivers from from your top two um, perspective? Okay. Getting close to 70 or so again. Yeah, so pretty pretty even across the board, another sort of 25% on the compliance side and then almost 20% uh, evenly split, 10% for basement flooding, 20% across the other three. So a pretty, uh, and, and you know, they're not mutually exclusive. Uh, and, and, you know, when you're doing stuff like this, you're, you're trying to probably tick off as many of these boxes and, and trying to to sort of satisfy multiple purposes when you're doing stuff like this. So not a, not a entirely surprising result, but uh, but thanks for that. Um, and so with that, I'll, I'll pass it over to Ed and he'll do a quick uh, sort of recap of our, our last uh, webinar and kind of what kind of led us to, to today's webinar. Thanks, Matt. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, so this is basically a review of the previous uh, webinar, but we understand there's a few new people and you may already be familiar with some of these concepts. I think it's good to refresh ourselves in terms of why some of these um, problems exist. So I'll start right away with, uh, with the basic premise of how these stormwater drainage systems and sanitary sewer systems interact at the surface. So um, we know that um, uh, if you're a municipality, you have standards, the province has standards, and in pretty much every new subdivision and obviously in existing subdivisions, we use um, overland and we use storm sewers to drain the storm water. Uh, this happens during a storm, this happens concurrently. You have 
part of it that goes on the surface. Uh, uh, if the storm is not that large, all of the runoff gets captured into the storm sewer systems through catch basins and the pipes, which is also known as the convenience system, takes away these frequent runoff uh, events. But as storms get bigger, and this is why we design and we have design criteria, not for the smaller storm events, but we have them for the larger storm events that creates problems if we don't take care of certain conditions. That's why we're, we're establishing a criteria. So the criteria is basically that the overland, the streets are supposed to carry quite a bit of the runoff for, in most cases. In Ontario, uh, based on my experience, 99% of uh, the roads are used intentionally to carry any, anything above the five year storm. In some of the regions around here, they use the 10 year storms for, that goes into the pipe. Uh, but the balance, anything above that is carried overland along, this, along the roads and overland flow channels. Um, the problem that we, we haven't, we had not fully considered um, uh, here in, in our area, there's already uh, papers that you can find all over and we can provide you some of this, is the impacts of blockages in, uh, at storm inlets. Um, blockages basically reduce the amount of water that gets captured into the sewers. It leaves more on the surface. And this tends to happen more during larger storms because a lot of the debris is carried. It's actually uh, a lot of the leaves, I don't know if you know this, but very large storm events even cut leaves off. It comes along with winds, these large storms, and branches fall off. All, all kinds of debris gets washed off onto the streets. And this is why we have grates, storm inlet grates on the side of the pavement to prevent all this debris from blocking this, the pipes. But they do block the inlets. And as a result, you end up with more water at the surface than we had intended in the past. So that's why you will see that some a lot of the standards, they they are asking uh, during design to assume that, that the inlet grading is partially blocked. I've seen pretty much a, a, a uniform 50% um, inlet blockage assumption that we have to make during design. In other words, we have to oversize the grades. If there's no debris, um, uh, there has to be more water getting into the pipes. We have to be careful because we don't want to exceed the capacity of the pipes at the same time. So there's a balance to be achieved between the amount of water that you put into the sewers versus the amount of water that you leave at the surface. Hence, um, in the 80s and 90s, there was quite a bit of dual drainage analysis being done with these hydrodynamic models. And that's when my career started. started and I, I used to do a lot of these analysis for new subdivisions. Um, at the time, we were only worried about storm drainage systems, making sure that we, uh, we don't surcharge or overload the storm sewers because we know that the foundation drains, uh, at least at that time, uh, starting in the uh, middle 60s, 70s, um, all the foundation drains, the groundwater on the, the house foundations started to get connected to the storm sewers. So we don't want the storm sewers to become overloaded and back up, the pre we become pressurized, overloaded, and the water either not draining from the foundations or backing up onto the foundations, which eventually will leak into the, into the basements. So um, we, we did this a lot for the storm drainage systems uh, and design, verifying that we have that balance between the, the five year, 10 year capture into the pipes versus the balance going over land. We never considered um, that leaving water at the surface or frequent events having more water at the surface because of inlet blockage would actually create a significant impact on sanitary sewers. So th this past year, uh, we undertook a, a study to assess the impacts of what happens if you do have more water at the surface on, on the sanitary sewers. And um, in particular, we, we went to the lowest common denominator, what everybody has, which is peak holes. Pickles in the manhole, sanitary manhole lids uh, are, are there to allow you to open the, the, the lid and also to provide, pre, provide some ventilation. Ventilation used to be a bigger problem before. Uh, it, it still is in some cases now because of sewer gases. So it's not as big a problem now because we're designing the sewers with enough self-cleansing velocities. 
but still, we still have these peak holes and we've done extensive work to quantify the amount of water that gets in through peak holes, through the gaps between the lid and the frame, and because of cracks around the frame, and which are all find their way somehow into the, into the manhole chimney below the surface. And we end up having quite a bit more inflows than just the peak holes themselves. But we started looking at just the peak holes, and a lot of the presentation that you will see today is just peak holes. So if you have more deterioration or you have gaps between the lid and the frame, the problem is even worse. It's bigger than what we thought. So normally in Ontario, I know that there is variation of manhole lids. Typically we have two peak holes. They're usually one inch by one inch square. And that allows us to put the peak, uh, you know, the, the peak to excavate and we, we, or, or these tools that we use to open up the manholes. And um, uh, so that we can access the, access the, the, the sewers and do maintenance and inspection, et cetera. Um, the other factor is the densities. How many manholes lids do we have in an area? And this is, has to do with the municipal standards and the min ministry standards of the maximum sewer length. And that before you have, you have to put in access uh, maintenance holes. And in general, we have a range of 1.5 to 2.5 manhole lids per hectare. Let's go to the next slide. And as you see here, and you saw in the previous slide, you see where this typical, uh, this is a typical standard. We just took a random one, but uh, pretty much all municipalities have very similar standards that they provide for the design of the manhole access hole, the manhole or the maintenance hole. Um, uh, at certain distance from the crown of the road, the, the highest point of the, of the pavement, the asphalt uh, pavement. Um, uh, typically it's, it's one to one and a half meters from the crown. Oftentimes during design, this cannot be accommodated because you're, you're doing bends and you're doing um, uh, intersections, et cetera. And oftentimes these lids end up being closer to the, to the gutter, to the edge of the pavement. But as you see here in, in this cross section, um, the storm drainage standards allow for the use of the entire right of way, which is from street line. If you see on the left side of the, of the picture, from street line to street line. Theoretically, we're allowed to use that as long as we don't flood the private property. Now, that usually translates to a maximum of 300 millimeter maximum depth, and that usually occurs at the gutter. Uh, but because the, the width and the cross falls, the cross section slopes are not that steep we end up with about 190 millimeters to 200 millimeters maximum depth. So this is our overland flow and allowance. We can use these roads as channels to convey anything above the capacity of the storm sewers. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. These are photos that we've taken recently, in fact, um, in, in some of our projects that we were investigating I&I. &I. And sure enough, you can see in the photos that yeah, water this, these are, this is not a 100-year storm. This is not a 50-year storm. This is actually like a two-year storm. And in some cases, it's even it, storms that are smaller that occur uh, during winter when the catch basins are blocked with ice and snow or, or intense, not that big storms, but very intense that carry a lot of debris and blocks and inlets. So again, we're designing the sewers for critical conditions for the larger storms. But this seems to happen on a fairly frequent basis. So for road, road drainage, our criteria is that we have to keep the overland flow within the right of way, within the public owner owned land. Um, and we don't want to cause any damages to the private property. So if there's any reverse slopes, driveways, we cannot go exceed the, the elevation of that, that the high point that goes into the, into the basement parking space in the house. That tends to occur more in older areas, but we do allow up to two to 300 millimeters of depth along the road. And what happens when that, when that occurs? Let's take a look at, uh, in terms of submergence uh, of the road and, and uh, let's, let's keep going to the next slide. Um, okay, so these are some calculations that I did last year just to prove the basic point. Okay, so what happens when submergence of the road occurs. And this doesn't have to be from property, property line to property line. This ha can happen in a frequent storm that goes within the curb, 
the face of the curve towards the crown of the road, okay? Um, uh, by the way, before I go too far, uh, I just wanna say that this is a webinar. This is not a, a, a course on how to do dual drainage. Um, we're thinking of doing that as well. And we need to hear from you if you're interested in taking a course that goes into the details of all of this, because we only have one hour and this is, this will probably be a, a half a day to one day at the least, I would suggest. But what I'm trying to make a point here is, is the significance of the problem. So the problem is that the storm drainage has a direct interaction with sanitary sewers on a very frequent basis during storms. That's why we've been doing flow monitoring, I've been doing flow monitoring since 1990. Uh, since, uh, and every time it rains, regardless of how new the system is or how old, or we always seem to see a response in sanitary sewers when we're monitoring them. Why is that? Well, is it because there's defects? Yeah, there might be some, but every system seems to respond. And that, but the response has to do also with the fact that there is some sheet flow, some that goes on top of the sanitary manhole lids and some water gets in. Now that's, that should be part of the allowance that we do for design of the pipes. We, we want to allow for that because it's practically impossible to avoid that, avoid it. The problem is when you, strip, you start to have submergence, when it's not just sheet flow that reaches the lids, when you have water running uh, along the gutter and as the flow increases, it spreads away from the curb phase towards the crown of the road. And, you be, and, and as you approach the manhole lids, regardless of the state of the asphalt, or if it's a new manhole lid or not, if you have pit holes, this is what's gonna happen, what these calculations show, okay? What I'm showing here is the, is the pretty much um, a, a situation that, that, that we had in the previous cross section. Um, I said that we're allowed to have 200 to 300 millimeter depth. In this case, I'm suggesting 190 millimeters at the gutter, okay? So if we have 100 millimeters, uh, uh, so, so if we have 100 millimeters, sorry, on top of the manhole lid, that's, that's if we have two to 300 millimeters at the gutter. If we have 190 millimeters, which is what we will translate as you move up the cross section of the road, you're gonna end up allowing 1.44 liters per second per manhole through the two pick holes alone, not to mention other gaps, other defects in the, in the, in the manhole. So as soon as you have 190 millimeters, you, you're, you're going to have way more than the allowance, significantly more. In fact, if, you, if, you, if we take the density of manholes, which is 1.5 to 2.5, and we take the average of two, you're gonna end up with almost 2.9 liters per second per hectare. The design standard that the MECP revealed yesterday that they're landing on is 0.28 liters per second. That's what we use for sizing the pipe, 0.28. But having 190 milli, milli, uh, millimeters of head above the manhole lid, you end up with 10 times as, as much. Now, this is the worst case as far as a particular location. The, the issue is how much do you need before you start exceeding 0.28? And I don't have it here, but it's very easy. It's an easy calculation. It's just repeating the calculation at the top uh, to find out what's the depth that you need to produce 0.28 liters per second per hectare. And that, that depth is less than one inch, one inch of water on top of a manhole lid. In other words, just over two centimeters of, of uh, submergence over a manhole lid, just over the two pick holes, you will exceed the design allowance of the pipe, cap of the pipe, the capacity of the pipe. And the cumulative, the issue is what's the cumulative effect? And you cannot just multiply times the number of manholes because every manhole is located at a different position on the cross section and a different position along the longitudinal slopes of the roads, different road shapes. And this is where the dual drainage modeling comes in. There's a dual drainage analysis that accounts for all these variables. The amount of water that gets generated uh, in terms of runoff from the area based on imperviousness, and these abstractions, the storm intensity, all of this gets entered into these dual drainage models so you can predict the spread and the depth of submergence or not uh, over each sanitary manhole lid. And so you can do this for different types of storms and we can assume different blockage factors of the inlets. So you can make decisions what's gonna be your criteria to 
waterproof some of these manhole lids or reduce two peak holes to one peak hole to, to remove, to uh, improve the asphalt around the, the structure. Uh, it gets into asset management, in other words, not only to the design criteria. But this applies not only to new subdivisions, but existing problems in existing subdivisions. So you can go back and do this analysis and start fixing INI problems that you may have. Uh, the, the only caveat I'm gonna say is that this dual drainage is, it requires very good surface topography. In other words, LIDAR. Uh, and we've been doing LIDAR and we do, we calibrate the LIDAR with, with total stations or, or GPS survey equipment to make sure that we have really good surface topography because it's not just the hydrology, the run of directions, but it's also the hydraulics. It's how deep the water will flow on the street and how, how wide the spread will be. So let's, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so this is an example of the type of analysis that we've been doing now. A lot of this has been research just to prove the problem to the ministry um, and so that we can solve a lot of these, uh, a lot of these problems with the, with the manhole INI. Not only are we gonna solve the INI problem in many cases, but we're also gonna solve storm drainage problems as well. If you're, if you're leaving too much water at the surface, you can get water to go into the private lots and go into window wells on the side of the houses, or you can surcharge your storm sewers. These two systems interact primarily because the, the, the storm drainage system becomes overloaded either at the surface or within the pipe. So dual drainage, so what is it? Basically, it's, 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 a, 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 it's not that complicated, but it's, it's somewhat detailed. You need detailed surface topography, okay? And you need the inlet locations, you need the inlet types, the grades, and you have to make some assumptions about blockages in the, in, the, in the inlet grades so that you can make a decision as to whether or not you increase the grade size so that even if it is 50% block, the grade doesn't become your control, how much water it allows into the sewers. So it, it basically dual drainage is, is modeling runoff flowing from in, along the overland system and providing for the capture that happens into the pipes at inlets into the minor system. Um, so we, the technique accounts for the area, the, the, the grass areas, the impervious areas, all that, which is what we used to do. Uh, we, somehow we stopped doing it back in the, I'm gonna say early to 2000s. And, but now we have better tools so we can, and better survey, better, if you're working with designs, you, you just basically take the design. You have the plan and profile drawings of the streets you have the storm drainage area drawings as well. You have our overall subdivision storm drainage area plan. You know the catchments, you know the, 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 the slope of the roads, you know the cross section of the roads, and you know the proposed location of the catch basins, and you know the catch basin type, and that's it. Just it's a fairly um, uh, redoable process. It's easy to, to review as well, make sure that you're connecting every pipe the way it's supposed to be. It's an expanded version of the rational method accounting for the overland flow. In other words, using hydrodynamic models, which are fairly widespread nowadays. So again, you have to get a key, an accurate, uh, an accurate representation. That's one of the keys. Get an accurate representation of the, of the major system, the, the imperviousness, pervious, the, the slopes and connectivity, and then the, 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 the catch pacing locations, grade types, and so on, because they are repetitive. This, this approach process repeats itself. Next one. So again, um, just as a summary, you see here, these are photos that we've taken again recently ourselves. Uh, uh, you see in, in one case on the right-hand side photo, um, the manhole actually being closer to the crown of the road than the sanitary. In this case, the sanitary had to be closer to the curb because of the, uh, the, 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 the bends or the intersection and the way that the sanitary sewer was designed. Um, we need to do this dual drainage analysis to predict both the storm drainage performance and the sanitary manhole lids that are susceptible to submergence. This, you only, you only need a couple of this to begin to have surcharging in the sanitary sewers and you just add up some defects, some cross connections in a sanitary sewer and then you have plotting or you have surface spills. So MECP uh, uh, has implemented 
some guidelines already that says that you should do an analysis, not telling you what type of analysis, but this is the only way that I know at least. If you, if you have other methods, I'd love to hear about it. But like I said, we, we've done this recently several times. I used to do it almost once a week when I started my career in the 80s, early 80s. And uh, this is one way that we can tackle the I and I problem in sanitary sewers and making sure that the storm drainage is fully understood and we're not, we're not uh, 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 oblivious to the potential problems that may be caused by the storm drainage system as well. So again, I already talked about the, uh, the MECP uh, guidelines. Um, it, it does require you, like the old guidelines is to say, if you have low-lying manholes, sanitary manholes, yeah, you should waterproof them. Now, it's not just the low-lying manholes. It's basically the manholes that are susceptible to submergence during any storm right after your design. Um, the question is, what do we do? So, most manholes should not be submerged. In fact, this is the good news. Um, most sanitary manhole lids, if they are designed and constructed according to the, your own standards, fairly close to the ground with the right uh, road slopes, you will not get the spread reaching the manhole lid. That's the good news. But you cannot avoid in some cases because the, the, the local topography and the connections downstream that you have to make the connection, the, the elevations of the outlets, you have to do, sometimes you have to do cascading or sag streets. Sometimes you have to do fairly flat slopes of, along the road. And, and you have to accumulate, sometimes you accumulate more water on, this, on the road than what you want it to because the sewers uh, are, are getting too big or I don't know what the reason might be, but you have to do this cumulative effect with the dual drainage. So manholes that are susceptible, especially those that are susceptible to frequent submergence due to, again, the, your own, your, the, own, the typical municipal standard of assuming 50% inlet blockage, you're gonna get more water on the surface. So understand which manholes are the most susceptible and just tackle those. This is an engineering approach that, that can be rationalized. You don't have to do all. In fact, our experience in the, the several times that we've done this, about 10% of the manholes become susceptible during the 25 year storm, okay? 10% um, in a subdivision. So, uh, and waterproofing a manhole is not a huge exercise. It's a, it's, it's a fairly straightforward exercise that, that um, um, it's cost effective as well. No, because it's gonna, it's gonna improve your treatment plant performance, your pumping station, energy, uh, and your potential flooding and spills. Okay, so the criterion in MECP is, it requires you to do that sensitivity analysis with inlet blockage, just, and, and then you have to make sure that, yeah, the, the, the system is performing as, as, as it was intended. I would challenge anybody here, if they have seen any analysis that verifies the catch, whether or not the catch basin spacing and the grade are sufficient to capture the five-year storm that we normally do uh, prescribe. I, I, I have not seen anybody do this verification. This will do that as well. It will verify that the catch basins are properly spaced, that the grades are not too restricted or too open, and, and that your storm drainage will perform well and your sanitary sewer inflow at vulnerable manholes will be, will be controlled. Thanks, Matt. Awesome. Thanks, Ed. So, yeah, as I mentioned, you know, there's a, the background and, and a lot of uh, um, the results and, and part of the, the first part of the webinar was also um, looking at various municipal design criteria and, and doing a bit of a, an analysis across multiple municipalities to see, you know, is this a widespread issue? And, and, and so part of the that first webinar, we went through a whole host of design criteria just to see how prevalent it is and, and you know it's pretty much um, you know most of or, or all of the municipalities we were looking at had uh, these allowances for for you know stormwater conveyance in the streets of course um, and, and then you know sort of looking at the potential impact um, theoretical impact on on the wastewater system so you know sort of following up from that and, and what Ed was mentioning um, we do have a number of case studies that we've performed uh, I think we're up over six or seven different case studies doing this type of analysis looking at it from a you know stormwater management but also an INI perspective um, 
So I'll just quickly run through a couple of case studies and the results from, from those, uh, just to kind of give some, some credence and a, a little bit of a case study to show that these, this is what's happening in the field and, and, uh, and some of the results that we're getting from doing this type of analysis. So this, this first case study is uh, just a small sort of pilot we did, um, 32 hectares. Um, so we, we modeled under various conditions, as Ed mentioned, uh, without in any inlet blockages, also with some blockage. Um, so in this particular case, we had five of the 50, so around 10% of those uh, maintenance holes were susceptible to flooding. Uh, we had a, a, an inflow sort of peak flow rate of 9.2 liters per second um, from these flooded manholes, which translates to about 0 0.2, 9 0.3 liters per second per hectare just from these sources alone. So if you did have other sources of I and I, which most systems do, um, you know, you can just kind of stack that on top and, and sort of understand what, what the potential problem might be in this in this particular area. So one of the things that we wanted to highlight as a, as a particular case study for this, this you know, background and, and this type of analysis. Um, case study number two, similar type of result, a, a slightly larger area, 100 hectares. Um, this is uh, inflow quantified during a, about a 25 year storm. Um, so the, just the, the peak flow from these alone was around 0 0.48, 0 0.5 liters per second per hectare. Uh, again, around 10% of the, the manholes in this area were also susceptible to flooding um, as part of this analysis. So we're, we're really looking at um, what's happening during these events and which ones, you know, targeting the, the ones that are more susceptible to flooding and looking at the whole system as to you know, where to best uh, focus our efforts. And then the, the third one that we've done, uh, again, 45, 50 hectare study area, another sort of 25 year storm as well. Um, and this one we see quite a few are susceptible to some sort of flooding, um, you know, with, in terms of the, the number that we have that have a significant amounts so over 100 millimeters of, of rain is around 20%, 15 to 20%, so a little bit higher than those two previous case studies, um, you know, the, it is pretty dependent on those site specific conditions that Ed, as Ed mentioned, the topography of the area, how close the maintenance holes are to the, the curb, what the, the store, how the performance of the storm system, uh, system is, is doing in terms of capturing flows, uh, what type of catch basins, all that really factors into these results. But ultimately, again, with, with just modeling these, uh, these sources alone, uh, around 0.55 liters per second per hectare um, from, from these, this particular case study. So just you know, trying, and, and everything we've done since that, we've done a few more case studies, as I mentioned, and they're all around the same amount in terms of uh, higher than the design criteria and, and the portion, and, and usually a, a small portion, 10 to 20% of the, the manholes that are the sort of biggest contributors that we're consistently finding across across these case studies. Um, so, you know, as Ed mentioned before, uh, you know, we, we typically do this type of analysis and then we, we make some assumptions. So when we look at the a maintenance hole, we, we assume the water that can go through it is just sort of a, a, a problem is, is sort of, um, just at the pickles. So we're just accounting for the pickles when we're doing this type of analysis. But we also wanted to see, okay, you know, what happens in real world situations. So we've done uh, what we call a maintenance hole flood test uh, at, at specific locations, you know, to sort of, you know, identify, we'll do the modeling to identify where these locations are that this flooding may happen. And then we'll go in and, and we'll will flood the, the maintenance hole to various levels on top of it and see how much water is actually getting into the system. Um, because we know in a lot of cases, they are sunk in, there's cracks around them, there's gaps, there's holes, as you can see in the pictures on the right. Um, these aren't always the case. They're not always um, sunk in, they're not, they're not, the, the pavement's not always cracked or, or broken around it, but it does happen in a lot of cases. So we wanted to see what happens when we test um, uh, you know, these at these specific locations and actually do some testing and flood these these locations to see how much water is going to get into the sanitary system. 
so when we do these tests and, and uh, there's a diagram at the top, so, uh, you know, basically we, we create a bulkhead, we, we create a wall around the area that we want to do the flood, flood testing and we'll submerge the, the maintenance hole to various depths. Um, and, you know, we're also testing not just the, the area around the, the maintenance hole, those cracks and, and gaps in the pavement, as I showed, but also there's typically a bit of a gap between the cover and the frame itself. So how much is getting in through those those areas as well? So we can really kind of calibrate what's going on uh, in at that actual location. How much is how much flow is getting in at various depths of, of flooding? Um, and it's necessary in a lot of cases to sort of calibrate these models and, and to make sure that we're actually accounting for how much is getting into the system or to quantify at a, a specific spot for allocation. So in York Region, City of Toronto, there's uh, capacity that needs to be created as part of, you know, developer led or, or offsetting programs. So in a lot of cases, more, more specifically in York Region, uh, we need to quantify exactly how much is getting in at these locations so that we can offset the flows appropriately. Uh, so, you know, why not just rely on on the, the assumptions of, of, you know, water just getting through the pick holes. So we've done a number of tests. And, and so on the top, these are this is five um, flood tests that we've done in the past. And that accounts for not just the pick holes, but also the water getting in around through the frame cover interface and through any gaps and, and cracks in the, the, the maintenance hole around it, as you saw in the pictures. And so we're, we're seeing, uh, you know, anywhere from 25 to 150% more flow getting in through these systems um, than just through through assumption of the pick holes only. So, um, and this is pretty consistent. It depends again on the, the, the site specific conditions, um, how much water is actually gonna get into the system if it's flooded, but you know, we can just tell that there is underestimation happening in a lot of these locations if we're just assuming that the, the flooding is only getting in through those pick holes. So again, to help quantify for I and I purposes, um, updates for your input to the model. So if you do this across a range of of maintenance holes and condition type, you can kind of see how much you should be assuming is getting into the system, um, at least as an, an initial input. And and you know to be conservative, you can use the pickles only. But it depends, I guess, on ultimately what you're using that model for and how much you want to understand the, the impacts of the, this flooding is having on the system. And I've already talked about the last two in terms of offsetting new development flows and, and sort of that basement flooding cost benefit analysis that a lot of studies uh, require. So this is a video. Um, so this is a, a video of us uh, doing one of these flood tests. And so in this one, you can see we've plugged the, the pick holes. So we're just trying to understand what's happening around the frame and cover and through any cracks and, and gaps around the cover or in the street around the maintenance hole. So we've done this type of flood testing at a, a handful of locations over the last number of years. Um, so you can just see based on you know, how much water is getting in at, at various flood depths and you need to compare that to the model outputs obviously to see how much is getting in at these locations. But this is a type of test that we've been doing to, uh, to actually quantify at a site specific um, sort of uh, scale to see how much is getting into the system through through flooding and through the the, the, the flooding and, and manholes that are susceptible to flooding um, as part of the dual drainage analysis to, to quantify the impacts on the sanitary system. Um, just a, a quick slide on, or two on on so you know if we you identify the problem uh, you know, you, you, you're able to go out, maybe you're making assumptions as to how much is getting into the system, or uh, you actually do some, some flood testing. You're able to identify these, uh, these locations that should be sealed. And so there's multiple products available for sealing. Um, a lot of the, the newer products are getting written, written into OPSD or various um, design criteria to be allowed to be installed in various locations. Um, so really the target is to, to, to look at those that are most susceptible to flooding and, and you know, target those ones, obviously. And then you know, as part of that work, you can certainly improve the area around the, the maintenance hole where there are those sags and cracks and holes. So, so you know, traditionally as you're excavating out uh, the, the, the area around the, the maintenance hole to replace the lid and, and 
put in a fully sealed frame and cover, um, you'll just naturally sort of remediate that that uh, those deficiencies around it as well. Uh, so here's a, some you know flood test results. So we did this pre and post uh, remediation. We wanted to test sort of the the applicability and the the success of actually you know sealing these and then test the products to make sure that you know if we do replace these maintenance holes with a fully sealed system that they actually work in keeping water uh, out of the system. And so uh, on the left hand side, you'll see both results plotted on the same graph. And, and so the, the orange line or the yellow line at the bottom is the post remediation results. Um, so I just kind of separated it out and put it in its own graph because it's very hard to see if it's if it's graphed with the pre remediation results. But essentially, um, the, the sort of moral of the story is that there's a, a great, you know, a significant reduction over 98% reduction, 99% reduction when you install these types of systems. And so this was, you know, looking at the pictures before and the tests that we did before and going back and doing that same testing at those locations after to make sure that, yeah, you know, we installed these things and they're actually keeping water out of the system. Um, so another poll just to, to see mostly for, I guess, the municipal folks as to, you know, which data you have in-house, um, if you're going to ultimately do this type of analysis, um, you're going to need all of this type of information. So just curious if you have this information, if you're sort of confident in the accuracy of this information so that you can then do this type of, of analysis, uh, on, you know, within the next, uh, short period of time. Okay. Probably give this one a couple extra minutes. So it looks like um, in terms of Lots of pipe data available. Um, GIS data is pretty good. Looks a little low on the sort of LIDAR side of things. So just something that, uh, um, yeah, we may need to look at, so, okay. So just some, some sort of high level conclusions. Um, so we can kind of see that the impact of stormwater and conveyance in the overland system is having sort of an impact on sanitary wastewater systems and probably more significant than previously believed or really thought of. Um, and so the solution is not necessarily to just run and increase, you know, the size of pumping stations and treatment plants. There are other approaches available. And, and this is one component of an INI &I program uh, and, and you know, a potentially significant amount of flow that we can reduce from these systems. Um, you know, if we use this across a municipality and look at, at the, the percentage, the 10 to 20%, let's say of, of susceptible, ones that are susceptible to flooding and, and cut those out when it comes to, to saving capacity and restoring capacity during some of these uh, larger storms. Um, you know, these are, as Ed mentioned, this is a solution that's applicable um, not only to new subdivision design, but also going into existing areas where you may have INI issues, uh, doing this type of modeling, identifying where you may have flood uh, sort of susceptible areas on the streets and looking at uh, where, where the maintenance holes are and how they may interact and, and looking at what, which ones may be uh, best for, for, for um, sealing. And this isn't a problem, we, we've looked at more, Moger, you know, in depth into Ontario for sure, but the, there's very similar design criteria across Canada, across the US and Europe. So this isn't something that is just isolated to, to our location. Uh, so what's next? So there's a lot of stuff that's going on. Ed already mentioned the provincial drainage standards, um, you know, municipal standards that typically trickle down and, and use the, the province as sort of a backbone or a guideline for updating their own standards. So looking at ways to identify these locations and doing this type of analysis to find, you know, sort of cost effective ways to reduce INI. Um, you know, the, there are methods and tools available. There's, uh, as Ed mentioned, the, the 
hydrodynamic models and, and you know, a lot of people are very familiar with using these. So there are sort of tools and methods available to do this type of analysis. Um, you know, we've certainly, as Ed mentioned, talked about doing training uh, about how to do dual drainage modeling, how to get the right data, how to work with that data to, to do this type of analysis. So that's certainly something that we're interested in doing. Uh, and then all the other sort of initiatives that, that go kind of hand in hand with, with doing INI reduction and looking at system capacity. So whether that's uh, you're looking to reduce basement flooding, spills and bypasses and whatnot. So just a lot of the other things that sort of go, go hand in hand and, and, and are, are very synergetic with, with the work that we're, we're doing with, with this type of analysis. Um, so I just launched the last couple of polls and then uh, maybe I don't think we have too much time, but Ed, maybe we can answer a couple of questions if people are interested in sticking around, we can, uh, we can uh, certainly answer some questions um, and hopefully if, if we don't get them to today, we can certainly follow up with, uh, with some, some emails and, and uh, reach out to people if they have any questions. Um, I guess maybe Ed, well, we, we do have a couple of minutes. So the first question that came in, uh, maybe if you want to tackle this one, um, because you're more involved with, is, um, is the MS, MECP open to changing their standards for I and I in sanitary sewer construction? That was a question. And I guess, I mean, we're not the MECP, so I guess we, we only have some say on that, but I don't know if you have an opinion or, or sort of insights into that question. Based on what I know uh, about the MECP, the Ministry of Environment, and, uh, um, they do have a sta standards for the design of sanitary sewer pipes, which are, again, the one that they released um, in the latest draft, which is pretty much the final draft. It's 0.28 liters per second per hectare. Um, um, I, they don't distinguish between construction periods versus when once a subdivision is is um, stable, it's it's occupied and and, and fully assumed by the municipality. Um, the uh, the the design standard uh, something new that came out from the standards uh, that they they just changed. They're basically saying that 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 rate should not happen over the life of the sewer, which is typically 50 to 100 years. So, which means that during a 50 year storm or a 100 year storm, you should not be exceeding 0.28 liters per second per hectare. So if you're doing a monitoring program and, and you're measuring I&I &I, uh, during normal events or even a two year, five year storm, which is, would be a reasonable event to capture during a one to two to three year monitoring period, you, you should be capturing quite a bit less than 0.28 liters per second per hectare. So the new standards that they are releasing, they're clarifying what, what the expectations are. Oh, I think Ed might have froze. Oh. Uh, uh, oh, there he is. You froze for a second there, Ed. I think you're back. Oh, maybe not. Okay, sorry. That was just construction periods versus um, uh, existing stable urban areas. Awesome. Um, there's one about um, manhole submergence um, in rural cross sections. So I guess maybe you know, maybe we can talk a little bit about some of the work we've done in, in sort yeah. of floodplains or drainage ditches and things like that, which is, is a very similar topic. Uh, right. we, we focus mostly on the roads today, but that is something that we've looked at as well. So, so, so there, um, road cross sections, you're going to have a rural cross section in an urban area, meaning that you have roadside ditches um, or swales on the side of the road, or you can have it in a rural area. In a rural area, you tend not to have sanitary sewers. Uh, you tend to have less sanitary sewers, obviously. But if you have roadside ditches, uh, it's interesting because oftentimes when you have roadside ditches and you have sanitary sewers, oftentimes the manholes are located in the ditch in our experience, um, which is which it poses a, a, an interesting problem because 
you, uh, the ones that we, we've been finding is that uh, that's where, because the frequency of flooding the ditch, obviously it's pretty much every storm and um, the integrity of the chimneys, the manhole chimneys, not starting from the top, sometimes they are perched, they project a, a, above the, the cross section of the ditch or besides the ditch, but do you still get a lot of leakage in joints along the chimney and, and the, the structure of the manhole. Um, if you wanna know uh, the frequency and the amount of head exposure, the, the, the hydraulic head acting on the, on the sanitary manholes are located in the ditch, yeah, you can easily do the dual drainage analysis. Or in this case, if you don't have, you don't have storm sewers, so there's no storm capture uh, to speak of, everything goes along the ditches. And eventually the ditches can even become uh, flooded, right? Where you have the road even being flooded. It depends on downstream ob obstructions, backwater effects. So um, in urban areas where you have ditches, you yeah, absolutely, they do, and you have sanitary um, sewers, or you, you, you sometimes you may have ditches and storm sewers. I don't know why you would do, you would have that, but the, the, the storm drainage analysis and susceptibility of storm water to flood sanitary manhole still applies. You can still analyze and identify sanitary manholes that are susceptible to submergence, um, even though you have roadside ditches. It's just the location of the sanitary manhole has to be accounted for in that analysis. I don't know if that answers the question. If you have our, uh, uh, another question on top of that. <laughs> Feel free. Um, I guess we just have one final poll. I'll launch that and then we can, again, really appreciate everybody coming out. And if you do have to jump off, uh, totally understand. Um, but we do have a few more questions. So we'll just stick around and answer those. And then, uh, yeah, again, really appreciate those that, uh, that do stick around and do want to engage a little bit more. Um, so Ed, um, I'll, I'll try and get this one right and we'll see how we uh, how we can respond to this one. But um, don't we use extreme flow events to model wet weather flow condition? Um, 0.28 liters per second per hectare is considered only during dry weather flow condition, hence the suggested low INI flow won't impact sewer during dry weather flow condition thoughts. Um, you're on mute. Um, yeah, so the 0.28 liter per second per hectare is inflow and infiltration. So infiltration is the phenomenon that happen, that can happen during dry weather or during wet weather. It's typically water that gets into the sanitary sewer. I, I've heard I and I, the term I and I being used for storm sewer. It, was, it wasn't created for storm sewer, that's called that's called joint leakage or something when you're constructing the storm sewers, you wanna verify the integrity. So I and I, in, in so far as sanitary sewers, it, it, it represents inflow and infiltration. Infiltration is basically groundwater or what I call trench water. The, the water that flows into the original sewer trench, which oftentimes is, is more porous material, is usually granular material. And, and, and water usually builds up within the trench around the pipe. And if you have leakages on the joints or cracks or holes in the pipe, you're gonna get infiltration. That's infiltration. Inflows are more direct, because manhole peak holes, that's a direct inflow. Um, downspouts on, on the houses that go into foundation drains that, and where the foundation drains are connected to the sanitary, like the older systems, um, that's inflow. That's, it's a very fast response and every storm creates inflows into the sewer, um, a sanitary sewer. So 0.28 is the allowance that the Ministry of Environment um, it has as a requirement, as a minimum to size the, the, the sanitary sewer pipes. So you, you have an area, you multiply it times 0.28 liters per second per hectare area and you get the flow that you should be accounting for when you're sizing the pipe. That's, that's the, 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 the inflow and infiltration. Then you also have to add the, the dry weather flow on top of that. So there's dry weather flow and wet weather flow that gets added together when you're sizing the pipes, when you're first designing the pipes. So I and I typically refers primarily to wet weather because infiltration occurs during dry weather, but uh, it's not as large as the infiltration that occurs during wet weather because there's water that the water table tends to rise during wet weather as well. 
and and um, pipes usually can handle the infiltration, the groundwater that 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 um, uh, rises above the joint, the seals, and the seals are leaking. And yeah, you will get some of that water, but I've never seen uh, sanitary sewer uh, be surcharged during dry weather or or have problems during dry weather uh, unless it's right beside a river. And oftentimes, when you have a river or or sometimes storm sewers that are um, but, but not even storm sewers because storm sewers don't carry water during dry weather. So, so typically it is it is a wet weather problem, uh, I and I. And the 0.28 in, includes the allowance for inflow and infiltration, and most of it should be infiltration. The allowance, sorry, inflow. Inflow is 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 the, the greatest amount that affects capacity. Um. Okay. What should uh, here's a good one. What should the I allow? What should be the I and I allowance in a new system? Um, do you follow the eighty four MOE guidelines, where allowable leakage at the end of a sewer's life is defined between point one and point two eight? How much degradation should we expect per year? I guess King County USA had a seven percent per decade after date of construction up to 28% for new construction. David's really uh, thrown us a curveball there. I hope he's still on the line. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is, the, the answer to this you see there, there's very little data, no data, or the data is all over the place as far as the degradation over time of a pipe. Because degradation, uh, that, that implies, okay, the joints are becoming more degraded and there's more infiltration happening with, between the pipe, pipe joints or you have laterals connected to the main line. And uh, those laterals, the joints, uh, you know, they're usually put in by, co by contractors over time and they use different standards and you get uh, leakage to those. They tend to be above the spring line, however, the, the top portion of the, of the circumference of the pipe. So you have to have water that rises above the spring line to get those leaking, but that happens all the time. Um, so, um, Degradation over time, it will happen, but it, it happens, it's anthropogenic, it's man-made, as much as it is time and settling of, of, of soils or uh, the, the pipe, the sewer foundation settles and so on. Uh, you get movement and so on. But so for the anthropogenic, the man-made one is when you start getting people connecting to the sanitary for whatever, uh, oftentimes that's the first pipe that they find or, um, in, in older areas where you have the foundation drains in a house connected to the sanitary, which is which is a partially separate, I call it a partially separated system. Uh, when you have a sanitary that is only connecting, co collecting sewage supposedly, uh, uh, in, the, in, new, in, new, in new houses, in the old houses, it wasn't just a sewage, it was the foundation drain from the houses. That is no longer allowed. Um, so uh, I, I never relied on uh, long-term degradation, the 0.28 is supposed to account for long-term degradation, but it's also supposed to assume some maintenance at the municipal side as well, that, that, you, that somebody will be doing CCTV during dry weather or, a, or CCTV especially during wet weather. So we can see uh, oftentimes find uh, leakage into the pipes or even direct connections that are happening only with wet weather. So, so if you if you are maintaining your system all the time and, and inspecting it, um, the 0.28 should apply over the life of the pipe. That would be my answer. Um, uh, awesome. Um, uh, is it possible to mandate installation of watertight covers for sanitary mantles throughout all developments? Um, yes, I would say if you're the owner, if you're going to be the system, The owner at the end, you're actually the municipality who own the system. You, you will can require your standards to at least do this type of analysis where you identify the, the manhole manholes that are most, most susceptible to, to getting flooded because of just water flowing on the streets and require them to provide the, the, the materials that you will be happy with uh, maintaining and, and in the future. So, just like any other system that gets assumed by the municipality. It is up to your 
um, standards as long as the 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 are as uh, uh, as good or better than the Ministry of the Environment. That's that's the you can exceed the, the ministry's uh, requirements. But yeah, absolutely, you can mandate the developer or the proponent to to analyze, or you could do the analysis and tell them which manholes you want to seal. I wouldn't recommend to seal every manhole because, uh, uh, as we pointed out. It's only about 10% of the manholes that are creating this problem. You don't need uh, to seal all the manholes. Uh, what, I would, what I would recommend is it's, it's at least change. Why, why do we need two, two peak holes? I'm not sure, I've never been able to answer that. Um, uh, you could just use one peak hole as well. Um, and, and you're gonna get some benefits right away uh, out of those manholes that are susceptible to submergence. Uh, hope that helps. I think that's a great answer. Um, what software do you use or recommend for dual drainage? Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna declare a conflict here <laughs> <laughs> because we've we've been developing these these analysis tools uh, in in a in a swim engine in a, a US EPA swim engine. We develop the, the interface to code this this uh, dual drainage. It's called uh, so I'm declaring conflict. Because uh, yeah, we, we 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 supply these these tools, and we we've been doing it because we understand that this is a problem. It's called Vio Swim. Vio Swim um, is part of the Vio family um, under Smart City Water. Um, Smart City Water is a sister company to Civica that it just does does uh, software for this type of application. We do sewer asset management and so on. So I just want to be open. It's but you can you can still do it with with um, US EPA Swim. PC Swim, who, who are a very good company from Guelph. Uh, there's Infoworks, obviously, which costs an arm and a leg. Um, and there's DHI, there's various hydrodynamic models. You just have to be, when you code this dual drainage, you just have to be explicit about how you code uh, where the inflows occur at each catch basin uh, location, because you're removing water from the surface, putting it into the sewers. And, and the rest over, the carryover, has to remain on the surface so the way that you code these dual drainage models is very important. Vio Swim it just makes it easier because we 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 see the need to do this many times and uh, we need to do it very fast. Uh, are single hole manhole tops being fabricated by Canadian foundries? Is there a reliable retrofit to plug one hole of the two covers? Not that I'm aware of. Um, I know we have looked in the past at some some plugs that they're using down in the U.S. Um, there's some plastic ones, some stainless steel ones. Um, there were some concerns with getting sheared off um, during you know snow plowing stuff like that. So that was some of the considerations that we took took into consideration. And then also, you know, just the fact that there was a significant portion of water potentially getting in through the frame and cover interface and those gaps and, and cracks and holes around the, the frame itself. So those are things that we kind of looked at as part of doing this type of work, the remediation part anyways in the past. Um, I don't know of anybody, I know there's there are um, foundries and, and manufacturers that are making fully sealed sort of gasketed bolt down or, or paddle lock systems. So I know that those are, are prevalent, but I don't know if any, I don't know Ed, if you have anything to add to that. But. Yeah, I've seen, I've seen different types uh, and they are as simple as uh, using um, cast iron bolts and nuts with pressure washers, but uh, the material, the, 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 you, don't, you want to avoid corrosion by putting different types of metals. Um, so uh, we can look into it and get back to you guys uh, uh, as far as, uh, uh, because I would try to put in the same type of metal so that you avoid corrosion of either one, the, you know, the lid or the, the bolt. I'm not sure how, these are pretty thick lids as well. So corrosion may not be a problem for the sh short term. I've seen in Toronto that they have done this, that they, they put this, this uh, rounded head uh, bolt and with a knot at the bottom. So to eliminate at least one, one peak hole or sometimes they use it for both peak holes and they, they Sometimes you can also buy these lids that have the, the little saddle type um, a hook that you can just, instead of putting a pick and, 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 bend, and bending it towards you or away, you can also just pull it up with, a, with this uh, 
with this saddle type uh, design for, for pulling up the, it's a little bit more hard, it's a little harder to pull it up uh, uh, the, the entire weight of the, of the lid. Uh, operations probably prefers the, 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 the pick hole approach with a, with a, with a pick or a, a, a one of those rebar type long bars. Um, so it's, it's not a difficult problem to solve, but we can look into it and see if there is manufacturer out there that has thought of this. Um, 25 year versus 100, kind of up, man. 20, 25 year versus 100 year for wet weather flow analysis. Its justification is risk tolerance as well as availability of data. There will be margin of error when we don't have long-term data and extrapolate from small events for large events. Like um, right. sort of a common question. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Is, but I lost lots of thoughts. Okay, so, <laughs> so, so if you're doing monitoring or you're getting events like a two-year event creating problems in your system, you have a you have a significant INI problem problem because a two-year storm shouldn't be creating problems in your system. The the Minister of the Environment. Basically, they're saying um, 0.28 liters per second per hectare should be should, should not be exceeded over the life of the sewer. So the, the asset life, which is typically 50 to 100 year, implies a 50 year storm or a 100 year storm. That's quite rigorous, quite um, and it's 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 hard to match because if you are measuring INI rates in the range of nine, 10 liters per second per hectare in an average storm, and you start to project. What kind of INI and I you would get in during the 100 year? I'm pretty, pretty confident that you're going to exceed the 0.28. Um, um, and, and, and in reality, likely you will in, in exceed the 0.28 because we have all these problems with these manhole pick holes. Even if you have a perfect system uh, with the pick holes being part of the design, inherent design issue, uh, you're going to exceed the 0.28 uh, because it doesn't take much. Again, one inch of water above two peak holes, you will exceed the capacity of the pipe underneath. So um, uh, we've taken um, a common law approach, so to speak, where most people have been using 25 year um, storm as the standard for um, level of protection against INI surcharge or flooding. Um, uh, I know Toronto uses a the July 1st, 2001 storm, which is equivalent to a one in 25 years storm, I believe it is. Uh, York region, the same thing, 25 year storm. In, in US, they use a 25 year storm. But the MECP now is coming up with this, this over the life of the structure uh, standard, which will raise the requirements. But at the same time, at least the people that, are, that I've, I've heard from the MECP, they're quite reasonable. Um, they want you to get started in understanding how your system is performing by monitoring it and, and begin to think and plan future uh, improvements. So by, by just adopting, let's understand the system. Let's see where the problems might, the biggest problems might be. Let's start tackling those. You may still allow surcharge in one location as long as you're not flooding basements. And, and as long as you have capacity at the treatment plant or at the pumping station, if the rest of the system is fairly, you know, doesn't create problems. So understanding the system is the first step. If you already have a problem and you know that you don't need to understand that there is a problem or not, you just wanna uh, focus on where the maximum benefit will, will be achieved by fixing the biggest problem within that area. So, um, but the direct ultimate direction is, yeah, 0.28 over the life of the sewer, which is 50 to 100 year. And by the way, I, I've, I've had comments about why do we use the 100 year level service for storm drainage? Uh, storm drainage being combined sewer and overland. We're supposed to prevent flooding of houses and, and property and, um, uh, for storm, storm sewers, for sanitary sewers, why 25 year? That's a good question. And, and, and uh, this is maybe one of the reasons why the NECP is now saying over the life of the sewer. Use 0.28 as your design standard, and that should not be exceeded over the life of the sewer that you're designing. Um, how will a sanitary sewer with high infiltration, 45 to 65% of all flows during average season conditions behave during a wet event? <laughs> with high infiltration, so that is a bit of a trick question. High infiltration, infiltration meaning groundwater? 
I guess it would be, yeah, consistent groundwater infiltration. Rates. Groundwater or trench, what I call trench water, which responds to wet weather events as well. Um, that's a good question. You, you, I would recommend monitoring the system just to see how was the difference between dry weather uh, I and I versus small wet weather events and small wet weather events in the spring versus the summer uh, or larger storm events. Flow monitoring will give you an understanding in terms of how, what can you expect during a very large storm. Even though you're not monitoring it, you may not be able to capture it. By the way that it behaves, at least during the few storms, you, be, you can start uh, doing an, a, a projection of how the system will behave later on. The, the beauty of this dual drainage is that it doesn't rely on projections. It just is it's a fairly deterministic, from a modeling world viewpoint, it's a fairly deterministic process of identifying locations where I and I, or inflow specifically, occurs. And you can just um, waterproof those locations. So you don't need to do monitoring to, to solve uh, some of the problems that you may already have uh, with this dual drainage analysis. You can actually go and tackle problems that are locations that are um, easily demonstrable. Um, given that sanitary design flows are generally overstated, so I guess, you know, using like a 450 liter per capita per day or, or something mm -hmm. like that could impact, uh, you know, velocities during the design process. So one could argue that a certain amount of INI is be beneficial for flushing purposes in your thoughts on that, Ed. I agree. I agree hundred percent. We still need to have self cleansing velocities, 0 0.6 liters, 0 0.6 meters per second. Um, yeah, um, again, they, they, they alternatively are going to be flushing quite a bit more. Um, uh, yeah, we, we're dealing with excess I and I in this case. Um, we still want some, some cleansing to occur, uh, but that 0.6 is supposed to happen during the peak dry weather flow when we, when we do the design. So, so when you're checking velocities at design time, you're supposed to get the 0.6 meters per second daily velocity uh, just from the dry, uh, the ultimate occupancy dry weather flow. Because again, when you first build a sewer, you don't have all the connections that will be generating the dry weather flow that, that is gonna produce your self cleansing velocities. So um, you still need to inspect and you still need to flush until you get those occupancies and, and you build up the flow. And with the new building codes that require less, that require water fixtures that generate less water, the dry weather flow has been coming down. The, the per capita, per capita um, uh, flow generation during dry weather has been coming down. And not only that, but the house densities, the population density in houses is coming down as well. So, so you still need some of that self cleansing velocity. And I agree, you do need either to inspect and flush or some INI is beneficial as well. Um, and then our last question, how much infiltration is reduced by just plugging the pickles? I guess that'd be more inflow. How much inflow is reduced by plugging just yeah. the pickles? It depends on the head, how much uh, submergence is, can occur or has been occurring at that location. So, so it's a fairly straightforward uh, orifice equation calculation that we've measured ourselves in the field with a with a bucket and a, and, a, and a stopwatch. So it's a fairly straightforward, it's a, uh, the equation is, uh, what is it? Two, uh, two GH times um, um, two C, two C, something like this. C, two, it's called root of two GH. Um, um, so time, time, yeah, times the area, C. Anyways, <laughs> the hydraulic equation is fairly straightforward um, to estimate how much, how much inflow you're gonna save by plugging each hole, but you need to have a prediction of how much head or how deep the water uh, uh, ponds or uh, submerges the opening of the of the of the pickles that you're plugging. And I guess you know, going back to the the slide two on the other, you know, the frame cover interface, any other defects around the manhole too, right? That could, if you're just plugging the pickle, you may not account for for some of that flow getting into the system too, right? Ed? That's right, and, and that, that's that's almost impossible to measure how much water gets in. You, we we, pro, we can provide you ranges based on what we've seen, based on the cracking, and and if it's Matt mentioned uh, that that 
sometimes the manholes are depressed or sag. You know, there's been some settling of the of the frame and lid uh, because of the deterioration of the mortar within the chimney. Um, so, but we we we've actually um, tried to measure inflows for small submergence, but we haven't been able because the water, all the water that was going, that we were pumping into the bulkhead wasn't enough. The water was actually leaking faster into the sewer than we could measure it uh, because there's so many pathways from all those cracks and holes that, that, that we could measure. So that's how bad it can be. But if it's that bad, typically you just say, okay, let's just, fix this one tomorrow, basically, because yeah, if you know that this, that area is receiving storm water, every storm and whatever goes in there gets into the sanitary sewer, that's, that's, a, that's a no brainer as far as, let's not even quantify, let's just fix it and, and, and see how, let's find the next one, so to speak. Awesome. All righty, so that's the end of the, the questions that I have, um, we'll stick around for another couple of minutes. So feel free to, to throw in any questions if you have them. And, and uh, nice to see a lot of familiar names out there. And, and for those that we haven't interacted with before, very nice to see some new new names. So as always, feel free to reach out, contact us if you have any questions. Um, yeah, uh, always happy to, to just chat and see where we can help. So thanks a lot to everybody and thanks to Ed. And, and, uh, yeah, um, like I said, we'll stick around for a couple more minutes, but um, yeah, feel free to jump off and, and have a, a great rest of your, of your day.